Voices seeking rewriting of Indian history are not new. For decades, there have been myriad groups expressing their discontent with the mainstream history as it's taught in Indian schools and universities. Some of the most repeated criticisms include underappreciation of ancient Indian achievements, exploitative portrayal of caste, undue importance to Mughals and neglect of those who resisted them, Delhi-centric narrative and oversight of histories of Kashmir, Northeast, and South India, romanticization of pre-colonial intercommunal relations, airbrushing of British atrocities, and disproportionate importance to Gandhi and Congress leaders in the freedom struggle at the expense of revolutionaries such as Bose and Savarkar. In the last few years, these voices have become increasingly louder, and, the, and with the rise of social media and ideological state support. A strong impetus came two years ago when India's Home Minister, Amit Shah, called upon historians to rewrite history. Yet for many professional historians, such demands are puzzling, as it seemed to suggest that Indian history was some sort of static gospel. They point out that history writing is a continuous process. New research and re-examination of available evidence are always underway. This, however, has failed to assuage the critics who allege a systemic bias in academia, resulting in what they view as distorted history. I'm honored to host a panel of some of India's most eminent historians whose well-informed views and varied perspectives can help us in understanding this subject with the nuance it deserves. Welcome to Argumentative Indian. We have with us um, Dr. Najib Heather, Professor of Medieval and Early Modern History at Center of Historical Studies, JNU. We have Dr. Vikram Sampas, historian and renowned author. We have Dr. Aparna Vedic, who's Associate Professor of History at Ashoka University. We have Dr. Tripur Daman Singh, who's, who's Postdoctoral Fellow um, at School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome all of you to Argumentative English. To begin with, can I invite you, Dr. Heather, to for your opening remarks on the question of the day, does Indian history need rewrite? Yeah, my instant reaction to the question was a counter question. Why? Why should Indian history be rewritten? Uh, history is not like science, where when a new fact is discovered, the old fact becomes obsolete uh, and redundant and is removed. It's, there is no paradigm shift, if you like, in history. You establish new paradigms. Now, unless there is something terribly wrong with India's historical research of, let's say, the last 100 years, then, of course, there is a genuine need to rewrite history. If the argument is that there are certain areas, both in time and space, or individuals, which have been marginalized, and their history has to be highlighted, then, of course, that's a welcome suggestion. Uh, regional history, particularly, uh, history of people, history of everyday life, uh, any aspect of history which has been ignored. And if you look at the trajectory of historical research in India, you'll see that more and more themes are coming in and being picked by historians for research. So first of all, I do not find any valid or good reason to accept the demand that this is an extraordinary time that we should be rewriting the history of India. If the demand is about improvement, if the demand is about fine tuning old researches, uh, bringing in new sources, making sense of old and new sources, of course, it's something that is already going on 
as we can see in my university and many other universities. So I, my instant reaction is that I do not find any particular reason why India's history should be rewritten. Thank you, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome to Argumentative Indian. Yes, I got the connection very late, I'm sorry. No problem, sir. Can I invite you um, for your opening remarks on the topic of today? Does Indian history need rewriting? Um, well, this is a very large theme, so I will try to put in a few words. You see, not only the history of India, but the history of all countries and history of the world need to be studied and restudied all the time. First, the period is extended. Every year, one year is added to the field of history. Secondly, there have been vast improvements in method. Methods are becoming more critical and extensive. You have criticisms of oral records and documents. You have linguistic criticism. You have, again, the science of linguistics, adding to our knowledge of earlier periods of people and cultures. Then there is extending knowledge given by archaeology and sciences like numismatics and uh, the general science of antiquities. Then added to this, you have the evidence of gen genetics. So clearly the method is always improving. You are getting <coughs> knowledge of certain kinds which our previous generations couldn't. And then of course, the content of history previously it was either dynastic or regional or religious history or biography. Then of course, <clears throat> cultural and intellectual history began, began to be added to it in medieval times, largely through biographies. Then from the 19th century, you had emphasis on economic history and thereafter qualitative history, history of technology, ecological history and women's history. So all these fields uh, require further evidence and obviously the field of history is advancing all the time. There, is, there are of course corrections in our previous knowledge which are also being made the time. But I don't think there is a case for just rewriting history, washing off whatever we have learned of history now and replacing it with what are, we would like the history to be. I don't think there's any case for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that opening. Now may I invite Dr. Sampal for his comment. Thank you, Yajur. A very good evening to all the distinguished co-panelists and to the uh, listeners of this podcast. I think it's a very appropriate question, Yajur, that you've posed through this uh, debate. Uh, while, you know, that's, I think the nature, the ephemeral nature of the discipline is such uh, that it requires a constant relook. Otherwise, there would be nothing for all of us in the discipline to actually work on if everything that has to be said has already been said and everything that is to be known is already known. Uh, I think it was John uh, Noble Wilford, the American historian, who had said that all works of history are basically interim reports. Uh, what people did in the past is not stored in amber or immutable through the ages. And he said, every generation looks back and drawing from its own experience, tries to illuminate the present and the future. The key word there was drawing from its own experience. So I think uh, that makes the discipline also very dynamic. It also makes it uh, so much more challenging. And of course, his, his, uh, a discipline like history is also an ideological uh, live battlefield, so to say, because as George Orwell had said, he who controls the past controls the future uh, and probably the present too. And uh, unfortunately, also when politics and politicians uh, intrude the space, then it uh, vitiates the atmosphere further. But I think, you know, you touched upon some of the 
problems uh, broadly of Indian historiography, which, uh, which in my view, takes a very uh, monochromatic view as of today, where large parts of uh, the country uh, remain underrepresented in uh, popular history. I mean, I'm sure there is there are historical accounts of all of this, but uh, if you even refer to, say, the school textbooks, which is what probably a young uh, person in India, that's their only exposure to history once they, you know, ditch the subject, once they go on to higher education, um, in which, you know, the northeast of India probably doesn't feature, uh, large parts of southern India don't find a place, uh, the achievements of the past in a way, uh, which there's a thin line between jingoism and uh, between feeling genuine pride for what we have done, our traditional knowledge systems. So how much of that actually is a, a part of it? How many of us know about, say, the Wadiyars of Mysore or the Ahom dynasty of uh, Assam, our young uh, people who ruled for 600, 700 years? Uh, whereas even, you know, sm as you rightly said, it's very, very Delhi-centric, where uh, seemingly insignificant dynasties like Tughlaqs or Khiljis or Lodis would probably not do so much uh, to the larger narrative of Indian history get disproportionate space, the Vijayanagar empire probably gets uh, one page or two pages. Uh, so uh, that that balancing, that regional balance, which uh, Heather Sahab mentioned, I think that uh, is also important. But at the same time, you know, constantly there are new discoveries. Um, just a few years ago, there was an excavation at Sinoli uh, in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, just so close to Delhi. And, uh, you know, that probably for the first time, made us aware that 5,000 years ago, Indians were also driving uh, chariots and they were horse uh, chariots and so on. So, and now, even as we speak a couple of years ago, we had the Raki Gadi uh, excavations, which was a combination of DNA studies as well as archeological uh, you know, studies, which puts the entire uh, you know, mythical uh, uh, construct of the Aryan invasion theory and so on, which was a colonial construct uh, on its head because uh, what the uh, excavations at Raki Gadi show based on genetics is something very different that the whole of South Asia has a common ancestry to uh, uh, a Harappan lineage. And uh, there's probably no invasion, there's probably a migration. So all these discoveries that keep coming up, those need to get featured in the popular historiography. Also, I think that the, the you know, world over, this rewriting is done not uh, when it is done, of course, with political agendas or with uh, with that jingoistic edge, it, it is a problem. But then decoloniality, where decolonial studies, where our history has been handed over to us by our colonial masters who taught us the a certain way in which we need to think about our past and how we need to feel about ourselves as a country, as a heritage, as a civilization. So decolonial studies across the world are looking at, uh, you know, indigenous express expressions based on, uh, again, facts and documents and so on. And there again, uh, you know, we the, the common narrative, uh, at least when I again go back to the textbooks, is we a young person who reads our te uh, history textbook, perhaps in a school setup, is seeing us as a litany of defeats that we faced, that we were a land of losers, uh, right from, say, the you know Battle of Tarain to, to invasion of uh, Sindh to God knows till the 1857 and wherever else. We've been losing one war after the other. Uh, but if we are around as a civilization and as Iqbal had said, kuch to hai ki hasti mitti nahi hamari. So what is that kuch? Uh, what is that tangibility other than the civilizational strength? There was also resistance. There were tales, genuine tales of valor, uh, of courage, of resistance, which in my view, don't get uh, proportionate representation in popular history. So all of this makes uh, the necessity or underscores the necessity to constantly revising history in the wake of uh, new discoveries. Of course, as I circumscribed outside the realm of politics and strictly within the realm of academic and scholastic discoveries. Thanks, Vikram. We'll move on to Tripur Daman. Uh, thank you, Yajur, for, for inviting me. And uh, it's been really great to listen to the remarks of Professor Habib, uh, um, someone you know I've held in great intellectual esteem uh, for a very large part of my life. Um, to start out, I don't think anybody would disagree that history is constantly being revised and rewritten. Uh, it's um, if 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 it wasn't being rewritten and re revised, you know, there'd be, as Vikram said, nothing for us to do. So revisionist history constantly come. It's not as if always it's new facts or new evidence that comes up, but ways of contextualizing the evidence, ways of looking at it, ways of you know theorizing it, 
uh, are constantly changing. And even if you look at something as you know straightforward as Mughal history, uh, sort of the old, almost proto-imperialist type of history being written by people like Jadunath Sarkar, etc., was superseded by the Aligarh school, which was then later, you know, challenged by uh, revisionist history, you know, led by people like Sanjay Subramaniam, Farhat Hassan, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this sort of revisionism is constantly happening, and I don't think anybody uh, it would anybody would make the case that that should not happen. Uh, you see this in the case of partition. You know, it's. Uh, I guess sparks fly when particularly contentious or particularly uh, sort of issues that are political flashpoints uh, that uh, you know come in come into the equation, and you have that again with partition, and you you know you've started to have that a lot with how uh, you know India's Mughal period is imagined uh, or looked at. Now, um, the way we uh, recall uh and revisit the past in many ways i guess uh constrains and determines the future as well um as you know a, a lot of people have written about so uh that's what makes history writing inherently i guess um political and also prone uh prone to this debate um secondly i think we should draw a distinction between history as a sort of scholarly discipline and history in the popular imagination uh, as represented by both popular history and you know basic textbooks, etc. It's not possible uh, for um, you know these sort of textbooks to really cover uh, cover everything. All they give you is a very very basic uh, understanding of the subject. It's it's something that I've never understood uh, why there is um, there is so much I guess uh, uh, debate over over textbooks. People constantly saying you know this is not taught and that is not taught is. Uh, uh, textbooks are never really meant to teach you everything. They're meant to give you a very, very basic uh, grounding in the subject. And for anything else, there's actually a lot of robust debate happening. And as long as that debate is robust, uh, comes from good faith, and is uh, uh, you know led by uh, uh, you know essentially led by scholarship, I don't think anybody uh, should have a problem with history being rewritten or revised. Uh, that's, I mean, that's what we do for a living, really. Uh, I think, I think that I, I, I'll cut it there. Thank you, Dr. Um, and now I'd like to invite Dr. Badik. Hi. Uh, before I uh, start, I want to declare that I'm having a fan moment. Uh, as an undergraduate in Stephens, I went over across to Hindu College one day to listen to Professor Habib. So. Being on this panel and talking with him today is like, I know I should be less abashed about it, but yes, I'm having my fan moment. So having said that, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I want to just, uh, I want to begin by saying that, um, you know, the, the title of the conversation today is in, in uh, Indian history, should it be rewritten? Now, I would like to pluralize the idea of history here, because there's a presumption in the question that Indian history is a one thing, but it's going to be, and that's what is, and and that's where the conversation goes into the black hole of textbooks, because it's presenting a particular kind of a narrative, or it's giving certain information about certain parts of history, and that becomes a sum total of Indian history. No, that's not what it is. What what we have is Indian histories, and we've always had histories and not just Indian history. It has been written in several different ways. It's been consumed in several different ways within academia and outside academia. And academics have depended on local historians, local bards, local narrators, uh, local collectors, archivists to write their histories. So it actually leads to a lot of false allegations and false claims. You know, if you imagine history as simply in singular. So history has to be imagined in, uh, and because the past is polyphonic. The past has several subjects, it has several historical actors. It's a historian who writes with the, may write with a singular perspective. Yeah, so that is something to be kept in mind while, while we're talking about history. And um, as, as uh, Najab Sab uh, said, history is not a static epistemic framework at all. Yeah, uh, so if it was, we would all be jobless. We would have nothing to say. Everything would be known. Yeah, so it is not a static epistemic framework. So the fact that it's we are going to be writing about it and rewriting certain bits or adding to it or you know challenging certain bits that's part of being a historian so no great um, 
uh, there is nothing, and this is no great challenge to the historian. I think the challenge lies somewhere else, not in the fact that histories need to be rewritten, the challenge is lying elsewhere. Yeah. And uh, just before I talk about what the challenge is, now, you know, traditionally, yes, the discipline with uh, roots in uh, this German school of Ranke, it did start out, it tended to focus on big empires, rulers, statesmen, and big people because they were the ones believed to be moving the wheel of history, impacting their times and leaving the mark on their times they lived in. So those are the ones who got written about. But actually now, if you look at the historical discipline, there's so much new history out there from gender to queer studies. We even have Dalit historiography, feminist histories, as uh, Habib Saab was saying, histories of environment, ecology, animals, you know, histories of uh, violence with histories of sports. So there's a lot of history out there. So to determine your understanding of history simply by a school textbook, I think is a little limiting. And there is always a time lag between the historical research we produce and the time it gets into a textbook. So school textbooks that way are always going to be limited. And another like very big false claim is the inattention paid to Vijayanagar. Now the entire theorization of state building and state formation in Southern India comes from study of Vijayanagar. Yeah. So, <laughs> You know, uh, uh, like I'm always surprised when this is thrown in the face of historians. Uh, you're not looking at Vijayanagar. No. In fact, we look too much at it. We need to look at other stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so that and uh, so what is really the question we historians need to be asking ourselves? Uh, it's, is it a question of rewriting that needs to be asked? Well, that's a question lots of right wing writers are asking and lots of people from that perspective are asking, but that's not a question that is really the challenge for the historians. Because we rewrite all the time and there are histories out there, so the challenge really for us is how do we get beyond narratives generated by state narratives that are impelled by nationalism and the ones that are also products of our privileged positions in the universities. So that's the challenge. How do we get beyond these narratives? How does a historian engage with the limits of one's professions and anxieties that come with it? Yeah. How do we combat the growing anti-intellectualism in the public sphere? How does one harness the small voice of history to create a public sphere, to create a more crit critical public sphere? This is the challenge for a historian today, not rewriting at all. And uh, you see, uh, there, are, uh, there are momentous shifts that come in your present that lead to different kind of writing. So uh, you had subaltern studies come up in 1981. That was a direct out of outcome of emergency because historians and social scientists realized, asked that you know, they imagined a certain kind of India will come into being, it didn't. So that led to a, the questioning of the way history was being written. And similarly, you, know, you have other historians like Edward Said and Johannes Fabian who wrote a lot and uh, a lot of their writing actually came out of Vietnam War and what they saw of it, right? So for, for our times, again, historians are rethinking their method. They're rethinking their archives. They're rethinking their audience because there's something like the 1970s happening here in India. So, you know, those are really the questions for us uh, as historians. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Dr. Vandy. So it, to me, some of the things that I came up here is that historians are uncovering a lot of facts, a lot of things are being there, but it's, history is vast. There are so many complexities. And like Ritu Zaman mentioned, textbooks can't actually capture all the facts. You can't cover everything in these textbooks. So they tend to be simplistic. So clearly there is some kind of cherry picking of facts that is always going on when these textbooks are created. And part of the argument is that these facts have been cherry picked in order to create a narrative. A very popular argument from the right is that, take for example, somebody like Tipu Sultan, that he's widely, while he's widely celebrated for his strong resistance to the British, he's not sufficiently condemned for his post-conversion and ill-treatment of several groups, including the Hindu Kodavas or the Mangalorean Christians. Now, that some of the, uh, so I want to get some attention to this fact that our has the cherry, have the facts been cherry picked to create a narrative? And is that what the opposition is to? I don't know what to uh, go first on this one. Uh, can I invite you, uh, Dr. Habib, Professor Habib? Yes, um, thank you. Well, I think Dr. Sampat has done a service to point out those 
particular um, objections to what I would uh, say academic history uh, that the present regime is raising. And uh, they are generally on the line of what the, the, as he put them, generally on the line of the Uni University Grants Commission's uh, syllabus for Indian history. Now, clearly, it is not the task of historian to glorify one's country. It's not his task at all. If that is his task, then he is a he is not a historian at all. The historian's task is to get the truth and to get truth about all kinds of people about whom we have knowledge. That is the primary thing, and that is what is lacking in the so-called desire to have a new history. Take about Aryans. How does it matter if Indus civilization was not Aryan or Vedic? How does it matter? Because the other alternative is Dravidian. You are all for Vijayanagara Empire, but in a South Indian will see that your entire effort is to make Indus civilization Aryan, despite, as we know, two very important features in the Indus script which connect it with the Dravidian. Um, proto Dravidian. I'm not saying that that is decisive, but certainly there is much greater um, connection with Dravidian uh, languages than proto Dravidian than with any Aryan association. The second thing is why are you so excited about Arya? How does it matter? Uh, the UGC says myth of Aryan invasion. And then it says, home of the Aryans. Why are you interested in home of the Aryans? How does India gain if it was the home of the Aryans? In the entire syllabus of the UGC, the fact is omitted that mankind came from Africa. We don't like Africans, they are blacks. So we won't have it in our history. Now, this kind of rewriting is atrocious. You come to regions, History can be only constructed if you know. You can't invent knowledge. Unfortunately for ancient India, before Raja Tarangini and perhaps Harsha Charita, there is no historical document. How can you reconstruct history in the same manner that you reconstructed for medieval India, which is covered by histories and historical documents? How can you create history from the home kingdom if there's no contemporary document, uh, chronicle of the home kingdom, all are later. So these are problems for historians. Vijayanagar Empire. It is seldom known that Vijayanagar empires called themselves sultans over Hindu rais. Well, why did they call themselves sultans? There was some reason for that. So clearly, just to run down sultanates and saying Khaljis and Tughlaqs should not get any attention is ridiculous. They controlled the larger part of India, which Vijayanagar Empire didn't control. The economic history of 14th century can't be written without the chronicles of, about Khilji and Tughlaq dynasties. So clearly, this kind of um, position is unacceptable to any professional, should be unacceptable to any professional and academic historian. Then there is the other thing. What about the Indians who otherwise did not matter? Dalits, Shudras, peasants, don't have, uh, in your rewriting, they never figure. What happens to them? You have historical records about them. You have records about how they were badly treated throughout our history. And therefore, in your rewriting, that will be not covered because that insults India. Well, historians should not be con concerned with what insults us or not insults us. We should go to facts. If there was slavery and anti-slavery in the Sultanate, we should, we should go to facts. The 
Nobody is saying that you don't cover slave trade in the Sultanate period. But you should also cover the abolition of slave trade in the Mughal Empire under Akbar. So by merely expelling Akbar from your rewriting history, as UGC says, as if Akbar did not exist in Indian history, and his religious policy should not be taught because, you know, uh, that uh, tolerance we don't like. We don't like religious tolerance, so why should Akbar be praised? So this kind of thing, which the rewriting of history demands, is actually the writing of fiction. It's not a rewriting of history. Thank you, sir. Um, you raised several important points. First of all, about the scarcity of sources and data when it comes to ancient Indian history. But also, I want to focus on some of the things which have come up quite a lot in the uh, recently in the mainstream, in the social media circles. So you pointed out about the Aryan aspect, why Aryan, why the Aryans have to be north, from North India, why does it all have to be ingrown indigenous? I think there's a, there was a famous quote from uh, Professor Romila Thapur and then when she said that um, the question of who first stood on the soil was important to nationalists because if Hindus are to have primacy as citizens in Hindu Rashtra, their foundational religion cannot be an important one. So, and, and then you also brought up the example of Akbar. So there is a lot of uh, questions around why don't we give enough emphasis to people who resisted the Mughals? Why is the history so centered around the Mughals? But when these questions are raised, uh, we, we, the only examples which are given are usually of the Rajput king or the Sikh king who resisted the Mughals. We never really hear any demand for covering Malik Ambar, somebody who actually quite successfully resisted the Mughals. So I want to get attention to this aspect. The other people who are asking for revisions, are they trying to correct the distortions or they want to introduce new kind of distortions? So for them, actually, get... Malik Ambar doesn't enter into the UGC scheme at all. The, exactly. It is also Rani Durgavati, it is Rana, uh, Rana Pratap. And lest they be understood, misunderstood, Chan Bibi. So clearly, um, it, is, uh, it is not uh, correct that these things are not emphasized. The point is, we don't know much about it. You know, you can't invent history. You know from Mughal historians, from no other historians, but Mughal historians, how Rana, the Rani Durgavati died and how her past was ill-treated. If the Mughals had not written about it in Mughal historians, you wouldn't have known about it. So clearly that, that you write, but how can you write further when you have no information? The same about Rana Pratap, all, all things are being invented now. So many things are being invented. Inventions don't constitute history. You have um, a very uh, Veer Vinod, uh, by Shyamal Das, written in 19th century, early or early 20th century. The massive history of Mewar based, based on documents, but you don't rely on that because uh, that kind of history doesn't serve your purposes. Um, Haldigat battle is, they are described as the Mughal historians describe it, although he was using Mewar sources. But Shyamal, uh, Shyamal Das was a historian. He, what, what he found in Mewar records. So the thing is that if you don't know anything about it, how can you invent things? When you don't know about many things about Rana Pratap, how can you invent them? How can you invent more about Rana Dar Durgavati? What more can you say beyond what the Mughal historians tell you? So uh, the, the UGC has put it there. They will, they, they, uh, apart from these, these two sentences, they will add perhaps more inventions. But that is not history. So one, one should wrong. be also conscious that our knowledge is limited. If I may draw an analogy to the Western history, there is, you could make the same argument about Western history. It seems to be all centered around Rome and Greece, since they were the ones who wrote most of the history, whereas we don't really know, we don't get the perspective of the Gauls and the Brits and, uh, and the Saxons. Well, it's because the answer not... that they wrote because they were more cultured <laughs> and Germans didn't write about themselves because they were illiterate. And so what can be done? Ancient India, except Raja, uh, except Raja Tarangini, doesn't have a chronicle. 
how can you replace how can you replace that omission but here is where the difference and uh, where the similarity then between europe and india in europe when whether it was romans or others once they invaded these societies they became internalized the distinction between the owner and the native was completely eliminated over time in india and uh, i'll get to you to put the one on this is it, it seems like there is a an emphasis to now redraw the distinction between the foreigner and the native i think this is and all imagination not for the native narrator you no know, people people don't know that the first poem in praise of india and patriotic poem is in persian by amir khusro in 1318 throughout sanskrit literature tell me one poem praising india and indians tell me of one poem the whole of sanskrit literature so when you are saying all these things these are imaginations amir khusra is praising indians above all people i don't agree with him i i these they, they like uh, the rss people praising uh, themselves but the fact is that he regarded he uh, india as his country and patriotism comes if you know about other countries as yuan chuang says indians don't know about other countries though they don't regard themselves as indians they regard themselves as uh, inhabitants of certain provinces koshal and so on yuan chuang says that unlike china which had one concept of a country we didn't have at that time of course rulers said that began to say that we have conquered whole of bharat when they didn't but that concept was very uh, weak the whole concept of hind and india and hindustan comes with medieval times in persian literature because those people knew about other countries and there they could say that our country is better than iran or turkestan and so on but if you don't let me, let me get tripurdaman to your team tripurdaman you written a lot about the conflict between rajput and moghul what is what is your view do you think it's the scarcity of sources on the rajput side are uh, it is is it because simply because of that that we tend to study more about the moghul system there is no Or, scarcity in bikaner there are immense records of moghul period both in persian and rajasthani there's no scarcity at all the scarcity is for the rewriting of history most rajput officer known chiefs including those of mewar became high mansabdars of the moghul empire they got jagirs outside they fought for moghuls outside man singh was the ruler of amber was governor of kabul can you imagine today the hindu being made governor of kabul that the moghul empire did so all this the, the kind of things that happened at that time had no relation with our present concerns it didn't concern akbar and the moguls that man singh was a rajput and shouldn't govern kabul he let, was let later me, on made the governor of bengal let me get vikram on this one vikram the history is report the man is waiting to talk about okay. moguls and the rajputs i think you should give him a chance <laughs> he's been uh, prevented go ahead um no i mean i i think uh i think to frame the moguls and rajputs in a sort of it is sort of dichotomy of either collaboration or resistance uh would be to 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 ignore his to ignore what the relationship was really like i mean both resistance and collaboration uh was very much a part of how uh these sort of small kingdoms or rajadoms you know as as one might call it Uh, related to superior imperial structures um so i think it's important that we don't uh, project uh, very modern concepts and categories into the past as though they were uh, in a sense you know uh, something with with immutable meaning so the meanings were always mutable the way uh, the world was conceptualized was always always very different and um even reading the same sources we can come to very very different conclusions as uh, Uh, as historians have done um reading the same mughal sources you know 
new age, the way sort of new age revisionist historians would conceptualize the Mughal state and its relationship to, to these groups would be is something that's very different uh, to, you know, what had been done previously by uh, by the Aligarh school, or then before that by by others. So it's it's important, I think, to remember that these are not stable, immutable categories or interpretations, uh, and there's very different ways of reading the same facts and the same sources as well. But, but when these resistances were going on between, let's say, of course, you obviously mentioned a lot of Rajputs were working, were, were actually uh, employed by the Mughals, but even the ones who were resisting, were, were these, did they have a concept that we are Indian and we are, we are, this is a Hindu fight against an Islamic rule? Or, for example, like, did they feel any kind of affinity in a common cause with the people in the South fighting the Sultanates or the Mughals? Was there ever any such concept? Because I recall, even in the time of foreign great towards the later Mughals, even then, the some of the Rajputs who were working with the Mughals, when they go down south to the Deccan with Aurangzeb, they do not find anything in common with the Hindus of the south. They're like, these are foreign people, they're disgusting people. They have their own biases at the time. But they don't find themselves that they are compatriots of these people. This sense of India from now north to south, they didn't even exist in this period, which is now being invented. Uh, no, I, I mean, I never found that. And I remember once reading, this was a long time ago, uh, uh, an account where uh, someone deployed in the south, you know, says um, to modern sensibilities, this will sound terrible, but he says, you know, South Indians in Hindus are dark and ugly and, you know, uh, you know, if you saw them in the night, you'd get really scared or something. So uh, they didn't. I mean, the Deccan campaigns are, uh, 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 I guess, a lucrative, uh, a lucrative venture for Mughal officers. So everybody made a, uh, they, you know, that, that's a whole different story. But no, I, I, I personally haven't. Uh, and I don't think anybody else has uh, either. But it's also, again, I, I repeat the same thing, to kind of project these identities and categories onto the past is, uh, uh, is also to set yourself up to interpret it very differently to how uh, uh, the, the, the people who, who were there at the time were interpreting it. And I think um, that, that's something that we have to remember whenever we interpret the past is that it, it is possible using the same sources and the same facts, uh, quote unquote, to interpret uh, uh, things very, very differently. Um, you know that. Let me get Vikram on a topic he can talk, tell us more clearly about Savarkar. Savarkar often comes up these, in these arguments about um, why history should be rewritten. He was brought up by Amit Shah himself in a speech. So Savarkar seems, argument is that Savarkar has received a short script by academia. Do you think there was an, there was an agenda behind it? Well, uh, Yajura, it's not just one person and that would make it very individual centric. But then as you also pointed out in your introductory uh, remarks, I think the, the story of the Indian freedom struggle too, uh, the way it's been dinned down uh, generations of our minds is uh, a very, very linear, simplistic, um, monochromatic kind of a version uh, where the mainstay has been uh, portrayed as the, the nonviolent movement and not disparaging that one bit. Uh, I think uh, the contribution of that movement to create mass awareness and the sense of nationalism, I think nobody can uh, you know, doubt uh, that. But that doesn't mean you cannot extol one stream of thought. And the, the, there was a reason, obviously, because the political uh, legacy of the nonviolence movement came after independence to people who were part of that movement. So obviously the movement that they were part of had to be extolled at the expense of other, other stories. We were talking of subaltern stories. So subaltern versions of the freedom struggle itself, uh, whether it was the armed struggle, there was never, there was never a lull in the, uh, you know, uh, a violent armed resistance to the British right from 1857 or even before that, all the, the tribal movements, the sannyasi rebellions, the, um, the, the movements in different parts of India, Maharashtra, Bengal, uh, and uh, Punjab, and so on, the, the Bheels, the, the different groups. Um, and from 1857 till the 1946, uh, what we still disparagingly call as the naval mutiny. And uh, the, the, the mutiny, which is what eventually, and the, 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 
the activities of the Indian National Army, which is what eventually brought India her freedom. Uh, now, these aspects seldom are discussed in uh, in the way they need to be. And of course, uh, you know, my earlier comment on textbooks, I think, was misconstrued that that is uh, that is the only thing that history uh, uh, is all about. But then we must realize that for a vast majority of Indians, particularly young people, uh, their uh, flirtation with the subject probably ends at class 10 or class 12 and they move on to other things. So the, all that they know about the about India and her past is through these textbooks. Obviously, all of us uh, you know, being serious practitioners of the subject can write several uh, scholastic books uh, which delve deeper into the discipline. But uh, uh, the lowest common denominator of Indian historiography was what I was referring to. Uh, so people like, like you mentioned, Savarkar or uh, others, I mean, a, a, a definitive bias, a persona non grata that, uh, you know, someone like him was made out to be for even academic study. Uh, and this uh, ring fencing, so to say that uh, we are going to decide who is uh, worthy of study, who is worthy of uh, uh, even being evaluated. Uh, this, this so little that was uh, written about him after the, the a comprehensive biography on him uh, in the 1960s, uh, of course, um, demonized versions uh, do, did exist with not too much of a fallback on uh, archival sources. Uh, but then every year, uh, you know, when there's reevaluation of um, you know, biographical uh, revaluation of so many figures and national leaders, uh, people like him were kept out. And, uh, you know, you in, I think in the promo to this uh, episode, you also had a quote of uh, the home minister who said, we need to use uh, history to rewrite uh, this one. And I think there was a reference to Savarkar there, um, wherein there was also a key where, you know, two years that he lived in London, as a student, he actually used the British records, uh, did extensive archival research at the British Library and the archives in UK, and got out documents on the 1857 uprising, uh, what till then was disparagingly called as Sepoy Mutiny. And that's how the narratives change. Uh, you know, Sepoy Mutiny then becomes the first war of Indian independence. I think they have two totally different connotations when they are uh, brought up that way. A mutiny is just uh, a momentary uh, uprising by a few people who were probably uh, angered by the beef uh, and pork lard and cartridges and all of that. Whereas a first war of independence has a larger connotation. Again, using uh, facts, documents, using the archives to, to change the narrative in a way which is Indocentric. As I said, uh, you, it's, history is a battle of narratives. And so when you use uh, the same sources uh, to build different narratives based on your, your, your interpretation of it, I think that is the, uh, the change. But what is important here is I've also understood that at least we have pushed the uh, envelope back to say Indian nationhood at least came up uh, during the medieval times because constantly we are we are also say, uh, you know fed that we were not even a country it was a British who uh, uh, gave us a sense of India uh, there was nothing called India before there was obviously uh, you know everything that we have today is thanks to the british but then right from uh, you know the vishnu puran which talks about uh, the the this landmass of uh, uh, bharat varsha uh, what is bharat varsha then if uh, we did not have a civilizational concept a political uh, you know uh, and territorial concept of india as it exists today with the borders and boundaries May, maybe may not be, but then a civilizational understanding of the nation uh, is something that, and the civilizational nationalism that always was there, uh, right from uh, the Vedic times till uh, the later times too, where even now when uh, there are pujas done, uh, the, the the exact sacred geography uh, is actually mentioned in the sankalp that is done, where there is a Jambu Dvipe, Bharata Varshe, Bharata Khande, all of that is mentioned, which uh, have remained so for uh, millennia now. So uh, that understanding our pilgrim centers, uh, this whole idea that to, to get away with any sense of parochialism, where you are actually tra traveling across, where every part of this nation is sacred uh, and no, no particular uh, one entity overpowers the other. Uh, so the idea of pilgrimage, uh, the, uh, the idea of even a Shankaracharya who established 
uh, muts in the four corners, north, south, east, west, almost transcribing in a way. He could have, he was from Kerala. He could have established all his muts only in the place he came from. There was no need for him to go as far as Kashmir and Dwarka and Puri and Sringeri to mark the four corners of this nation. So geographically, the sacred uh, place, the 52 Shakti Pithas, uh, which are scattered across the subcontinent, all of that gave a civilizational unity, a civilizational sense uh, of us as a, as a civilizational uh, you know, unit. Uh, politically, of course, that's uh, all nation states were formed only in the modern period. So India also evolved that way only much later. So, so to, um, to bandy only on that particular aspect, I think was wrong. So at least we've had some consensus that we've probably gone back to Khusro and said he was the one who extolled us as a nation, which is a good thing. Thanks, Vikram. I want to flip that question to Dr. Vedic. Um, Dr. Vedic, I know you are doing work on Chandrasekhar, Azad, and others. Do you agree that revolutionaries, other than the Congress Party, like have been given a short shrift in India's the way the history has been drafted? And secondly, for example, even with somebody like Savarkar, while he was not really a mass mobilizer, he he, he hasn't even get gotten sufficient credit for being a notable social and political thinker of the time. Do you think that argument or that claim is accurate? You know, a lot of his conversations about history get hijacked and, um, you know, you, you end up responding to, I feel, what are non-questions of history. But, so I'm going to, respond to this in the way I think appropriate your your question. So I do feel there's a lot of scholarship on Savarkar. Yeah, so there is Vinayak Chaturvedi's work, Joy Chatterjee, Janki Bhakle, Radhuramsha Mukherjee. They have written on uh, Savarkar. So it is not that Savarkar has not received any attention, but uh, the question is what kind of attention and which period of, and you know, my own work on Andamans, uh, I encountered, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, there's a lot of Savarkar uh, when you look at the history of the J. So, you know, it's not that he's not received attention. But, uh, uh, so I was just saying that there is scholarship on uh, Savarkar. So it's not that he's not been written about at all. And in fact, uh, it's interesting that many of these revolutionaries would, even in his older days, when he was really had separated from his uh, ideology, they would go back and visit him and they used to call him Baba. So it was not that, uh, you know, that Savarkar has not received any attention at all. Now, uh, going back to Chandrasekhar Azad, and I'm quite forgetting your question, actually. <laughs> yeah, Jor. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, th there is this repeated accusation. It's actually come up on in our debate as well many times that India's, when you read Indian freedom struggle history, it, just, it seems like, the movement entirely started when Mahatma Gandhi came on the scene and has been entirely centered around Mahatma Gandhi. And this is uh, disrespectful to so many thousands of others who gave up and sacrificed their lives and towards the freedom movement before and during Mahatma Gandhi's period. Mani, like, this is like a contest for greatness. Like, is history writing about that? You know, really, I don't think historians think about the past in that manner. So, um, yeah, so I mean, all sorts of, uh, you know, if it wasn't written about him like that, then people would say, no, he needs to be resurrected and written about. So they could, any kind of argument you can make because history writing is a present is that. We write the history of the past in the present. So the questions of the present do impress upon the past, but the categories coming out of the present shouldn't. And that's the fine line that a historian needs, to, a good historian needs to treat that you know, many of the questions that you would ask of the past, the many of the, uh, the queries we would have of the past would be impelled by the present day politics. That does happen. But if you were to ask, uh, like a uh, question often raised is, Aurang why was Aurangzeb not democratic? Are bhai, Mughal emperor, hai, what are you? So he's not living in a democracy. Why are you asking him that question? You're asking a question where the history won't yield. Yeah? So I think that's the kind of questioning that this uh, falls into. So I'm, I know you would want a more concrete answer, but I'm unable to give it because these questions are like that. 
ये क्यों नहीं था वो क्यों नहीं था ब्रिटिश सो या questions which are illogical are asked on all sides and uh, mentioned and i think it's a it's a duty of historians to wade through these landmines and come up with answers and solutions um, so you brought up orangzeb actually that's one of the more controversial to- topics which comes up again and again repeatedly in these kind of conversations when it comes to moguls even if people don't uh, expect them to be democratic the question is the, the way history has been taught they are celebrated as uh legitimate rulers of india whereas now there is a view especially common on right wingers that they were foreigners just in the way the british had colonized they had colonized us and till the and so it's basically the they like i think vikram you mentioned earlier we are constantly celebrating the people who invaded us and occupied us but clearly we also had successful battles and why don't we celebrate the heroes who resisted the foreigners or the outsiders maybe we'll get dr heather on this one uh <clears throat> the first thing i would like to say is that uh it's important to remember that history is an intellectual science it's not uh, a utilitarian science that we can use to uh, foresee the future or uh, fix our present problems the purpose of history is to reconstruct aspects of the past which are not known and convert it into knowledge not a means to reorder society or uh, do identity politics so that's the first thing the biggest threat that history is facing today is that it's being removed from its intellectual context and put into popular domain and political domain i think this is the biggest problem that we are facing and here i would like to slightly disagree with uh, tipu daman that popular history is different from textbook history textbook history is written very carefully i have myself been uh, the author of two chapters for class 11th and 12th of ncert textbooks and i should remind uh, my listeners that there is a full chapter wonderful chapter on the vijayanagar empire in that in the book on indian history uh, which we should not forget and there is a chapter on the moguls so this whole question of uh, disproportionate history certain things being uh, marginalized and ignored i think it is once again some kind of an invented phenomenon um i should also like to remind that the history of the meva house of mewar post maharana pratap is totally forgotten and that is a, that is great injustice to the house of meva after the death of maharana pratap his son rana amar singh and his son became part of the mogal bureaucracy not amar singh so much as his son a very close friend of purram who later became shah jahan and there's a whole history of how he was brought into the mogul harem where nobody was allowed and nur jahan gave him gifts uh, and he was treated with great respect and before coming to the court he was trained in the etiquettes of the mogul court so that people do not laugh at him and there began a very close relationship and friendship between the house of mewar and the house of moguls which spanned for a longer time than the battle of haldighat so it's also important for us to remember that we are ignoring a large part of the history of the relationship between moguls and rajputs so there is another kind of distortion we should be looking at and i would like to resonate professor habib's point that historians 
need sources. And believe me, every single day, we look for new sources. We try to, and history is the only discipline, by the way, which has the biggest repertoire of sources, where we use from film clips to artifacts, everything, manuscripts, coins, epigraphs, nothing is excluded. So every single day, historians all over the world, professional historians who are eager to reconstruct the past without any tendentious motive or objective, I mean, innocent mistakes can be made, are trying to push the frontiers of knowledge by looking for more sources, by making sense of older sources, and trying to give, put perspective on things that are difficult to understand. So that is what modern historians are doing. Unfortunately, in our country, the wind is blowing on the opposite side. And there's a great deal of anti-intellectualism, the great deal of politics that is intruding into uh, knowledge formation. And that is the biggest danger that we are facing. And I would also like to mention very quickly to Vikram, that there was an author, 14th century author of five books, uh, Thakura Bheru, who invokes Alauddin Khilji in one of his books as Ashwapati Mahanarendra Alauddin Badsha. So you should also read this literature. It is in Apabhramsh laced with Prakrit. It is a book on metallurgy, on mathematics, uh, Ganit Kaum, Kaumudi. Uh, these are books written during the Khilji period where the people who lived under these regimes remembered the rulers, not as how they are being remembered today. Yeah, I would add to this, uh, you know, Ramya Srinivasan's work on Braj Bhasha, Alison Bush's work and uh, Ramya's, and she has looked at this poetry in the courts of the Rajput rulers. And in the court poetry in Braj, there is an invocation of Akbar and he's likened to Lord Krishna. So just adding to Najaf's point that histories are these also. So it's not just about we should study this and we should study that. Fine. The sources of the times actually say something very different. So I think some way we need to pay attention to that as historians. Dr. Vedic, which, which do you want to be serious? Uh, okay, yes, please go ahead for a court poet or a court historian to liken uh, the king to, to God, uh, I think is also uh, not something that should surprise because that's how probably uh, the court poet also made a, a livelihood because you know you have to extol the emperor that I don't know how much of that actually proves much of a point there. But then to Najafji's uh, you know, point that you know, something catastrophic is happening now, I'd like to draw the attention of uh, the panel and also the listeners to, um, I mean, Outlook magazine in 1989, I think came out with this uh, article, which talked about a circular that was uh, uh, circulated by the West Bengal government, which was then under Marxist rule, uh, it, a circular dated 28th April, 1989, uh, for the West Bengal, uh, you know, secondary education board. Uh, and this was the government of Bengal actually advising this, uh, the entire board to re review all the history textbooks uh, for the state and with specific instructions. And I quote from that circular uh, as it is, Muslim rule should never attract any criticism. Destruction of temples by Muslim rulers and invaders should not be mentioned. Unquote. And the the in fact, I got a copy of that circular too uh, sometime and saw what what was this hullabaloo about. So there were these two specific columns, and since it was a, all Bengali books, Ashuddho and Shuddho, uh, you know, Ashuddho or all the impurities, so to say, in the textbooks which uh, these worthies in government were reviewing, uh, anti-intellectualism much, uh, and Shuddho, the uh, so-called correct version. So any mention of any kind of, uh, you know, uh, atrocities, any kind of destruction, any kind of uh, pillage or genocide, all this came under Ashuddho, 
and the shuddho part was just delete this and the most extensive deletions if you see in that circular were in regard to a complete chapter on aurangzeb's policy on religion so that's why i'm saying it's uh, it's nice to be alarmist and say something catastrophic is happening right now history has always been the handmaiden of the ruler uh, so a, a court poet will have to ex just as a court poet in medieval times would have to extol her king as a uh, incarnation of god in democratic times uh, it's the most of the historians who would and these books and the circulars which actually tow the line of the ideology of the time so if it is being rewritten now it was rewritten some time else so this battle is what also makes the subject interesting it makes it uh, that much more otherwise it's a, it's a static fossil that all of us are staring at so it is so malleable because everybody can mold it in the way they want to so uh, the common thing is for the sake of national unity we should not talk about uncomfortable uh, chapters of our past because somehow it is assumed that even mentioning all of that uh, somehow ruffles today's unity or whatever uh, which is i think uh, being very very unfair to communities today the albatross of all these invasions and these barbarities do not lie on people of today but by whitewashing it by airbrushing all these excesses and saying oh but it's going to be very sensitive there has to be national unity has to be maintained so we are not going to talk about it uh, a truth and reconciliation commission that happened in south africa which ensured that all these uh, you know uncomfortable topics are spoken about uh, i think history offers also that space worldwide uh, where uncomfortable topics can be discussed about you can uh, openly uh, come together heal the wounds of the past and move on if you do not heal those wounds if you keep passing the muck under a carpet and then putting deodorant over it uh, i think it has a it has a tendency to resurface itself in pernicious ways uh, whether it's in politics it's in society or clashes and all kinds of uh, other uncomfortable things we seeing today so truth and reconciliation and this ubuntu which i think desmond so, uh, Tutu and Vic, 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 that, uh, thank you for those Vikram, thank you for those wise words but i think this message sort of pay, falls on deaf ears on all sides even if we look at the people who are asking to bring out all the ugly facts about the islamic atrocities and all let's just focus on the bengal example none of these nationalists want you to focus on the maratha invasion the repeated no, maratha no, invasions no, on bengal and bihar that's not no case ajay ju the I fact mean, is, it doesn't fit to into be. their narrative it doesn't fit into the narrative the fact that yeah. hundreds of thousands of hindus were massacred by this sort of hindu nationalist the marathas that narrative doesn't fit you talk about the marathas or the bengalis not talking about the islamic atrocities who's talking about the hindu atrocities on the bengali look do it's why i said it, 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 it select it isn't it selective fact fact uh, picking on all sides that's going on you know i think Sorry, uh, I the way okay. uh, moguls had their court poets we know who are the court poets today so uh, and court historians today so you know uh, i think uh, i'll give the platform to professor heather who's been wanting to say so, so. exactly so yeah say patronage so, so yes, subject court poets forget court poets uh, vikram uh look at the autobiography of a 17th century jain merchant a very small merchant who was a poet writer and deeply religious now look at what he has to say about the mogul empire he was the one who was teaching the jaunpur governor chin kulich khan sanskrit and he writes that every day i go to him and he treats me with respect and i teach him because he doesn't know sanskrit now he fell from the stairs when he heard the news that akbar was dead because he thought that the world had come to an end so he was not a court poet you read his autobiography which i have which is in madhya desh ki boli which is avadhi and braj uh, and you get a picture of the mughal empire he had nothing to do with the mughal state he was an ordinary merchant so the picture which you get from that autobiography which i teach every single year to my students the first lecture begins with his autobiography where you have a picture of ordinary people living everyday life with a state which is somewhere there looming large but they think it is protecting them so that kind of a notion is under challenge today 
and that state is being demonized. So that is something that really worries me. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Heather. I have a question from the audience and this is specifically for Dr. Professor Habib. This question comes from um, the, the author Abhas Maldihar. So he points to your book, Akbar and His, and His India. Him, you have mentioned um, you have mentioned how Akbar suppressed Muslim sects, which were considered heretic by the orthodoxy. You talk about Akbar, how Akbar orders exhumation of Mir Murtaza Shirazi, a Shia buried in Delhi for the great proximity to that of Amir Khusro, a Sunni. Uh, <clears throat> you also talk about how Akbar suppressed Madhavism. So how, how but, but then what uh, baffling is then how do you conclude that Akbar was um, tolerant? Well, um... and, yeah, I mean, that, that's basically the question, yeah. Well, actually, this is a question of period. Akbar began his tolerant measures immediately, as far as Hindus were concerned, immediately after his, he assumed power in 1560, when this, after dismissing Baram. Now, uh, he abolished the pilgrimage tax, he abolished jazia, he employed began to employ Rajputs in the bureaucracy. Uh, he began to give grants to ordinary Hindus, to temples, all in 60s. <coughs> but at the same time, among Muslims, uh, there is a curious hostility to uh, non-Orthodox sects. But the Mughals accommodated Shias and Sunnis, but they had these, these prejudices against Mahdavis, for example. And, um, but Akbar changed his, uh, but that didn't affect the Hindus. This was an internal, internal issue among Muslims, but Akbar changed his attitude totally after 1580. When in fact, he became, began and assumed a neutral position towards Islam, in fact. Well, um, no, I was saying that uh, Akbar's, there are two periods. One was after 1580 when Akbar totally became neutral towards Islam. I mean, his officials, the like uh, Abul Fal could, did not call Islam religion of Islam as Islam, but Ahmadi Kesh or Mohammedanism. So that period lasted till his death. So this is a di distinction to be made. The main social reforms also came in due during this period. Thank you. So basically, he sort of evolved during his life. But I think what you pointed out earlier was this is the difference. One has to see what period you are referring. Yes, exactly. But as far yeah, as I think that is concerned, the, the, there was no difference. I mean, the tolerant policy continued. Yeah, I think that is the more relevant point uh, that you have to consider the period and relatively. I mean, this was the period where inquisitions were going on in the other major powers. Uh, at the time, and there wasn't really a concept of uh, accepting uh, different schools of thought and having any kind of tolerance to dissent. So this is the period in which he lived. It's a bit unfair to compare him when we are aware of modern democracies and all. Um, <clears throat> okay, with this, we are moving. To, uh, we are running out of time, so I want to move towards very brief concluding remarks from all of you. Once again, thanks to all of you for coming today. This was. Uh, it's an honor to have this to be hosting this panel. And I really apologize for the technical difficulty we had during the, during the session. But can I uh, start with the conclusions? So um, we'll, I'll start with Dr. Heather and then we'll move, on, move along. With just very brief uh, concluding remarks and where, what do you suggest is the way forward? So uh, you were on mute. Uh, I would reiterate my position that there's nothing terribly wrong with Indian history writing, while at the same time acknowledging the possibility that historical research should expand in different ways and history writing historian should be responsible, not tendentious, not selective, even though they can have preferences. The moment a young researcher chooses her 
theme, she expresses her preference. You can call it bias, you can call it anything. And at least in my university, luckily, she is allowed to continue with her research. So as long as we have this freedom, academic freedom, and not obliged to function to a rhythm which is not our own, then we can actually write very good history uh, because we have the ability, and I have been Professor Habib's student who taught me how to read very difficult scripts, which I am trying to pass on to my students. These uh, texts are very difficult to read and there will be time perhaps when nobody would be able to decipher these. So nobody realizes that medieval historians have this additional responsibility of deciphering documents. Their documents are not in English and are not easily comprehensible. So the first round is to decipher these difficult documents, cull whatever you think is meaningful and relevant and then organize your material to write. Now that exercise is going on. We don't advertise it, but that is going on. And of course, I totally agree that regional history, provided you have sources, provided you do not invent characters. And the final thing I would like to say, which I used to, which I say to my students, don't fall in love with the past. Don't fall in love with the characters of the past. Don't have villains and heroes in the past. As long as you keep that distance, you'll be able to keep your sanity and professionalism and write good history. Okay. Um, Supridhaman, are you on? Uh, yes, yes. Um, no, I think uh, I think there's uh, just to round up. Just uh, we we do have, we have to distinguish between the meta question that you know you've put up for debate, uh, and the very specific instances that we brought up, whether it's about Aurangzeb or whether it's about Savarkar, etc. Uh, and about the meta question, I think uh, I don't think there's that much disagreement uh, across the panel. That you know, history writing is, is is something that's constantly in motion. Things are you know constantly being uh, revised. Things are constantly being. Uh, recontextualized things are constantly being reinterpreted and I don't think uh, anybody would uh, would really dispute this uh, and um, there is an interesting thing that Professor Heather has said and that is about language and I think uh, uh, that is something that uh, you know that we that we should all remember is that actually uh, history writing is, very, is a very complex time consuming uh, and uh, difficult business. And um, it does require uh, knowledge of, uh, of multiple languages, scripts, et cetera. And that's something that actually requires a lot of investment from, from either side. Uh, and um, actually, I think that that should be one key takeaway from the debate if, uh, uh, you know, if we're going to have one takeaway. But on the meta question, actually, I think most, most panelists seem, uh, seem broadly agreed. I don't think anybody has really uh, said that there's any Thing against uh, revisionist history or rewriting history. That, that's that's part and parcel of our jobs. That's what we do. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Doc, can I invite you, Dr. Vedic, for your concluding remark? Yeah. So um, I want to go back to that moment about subaltern studies, and uh, and go back to the craft of the historian. So the historian practices their craft in the present. That's we can't get away from. We write about the past in the present. So a lot of the political atmosphere of the present, the, uh, the historical location of the historian impacts the kind of questions they ask of the past and the way they practice their craft. Yeah, so, so subaltern studies, that big shift came about in historical writing or those questions were being asked because the, those historians lived through a certain moment of history which impacted their sense of self and that impacted their craft. And so what is one of those defining sort of uh, moments in historical writing because it not only impacted, it coalesced with postmodernism, postcolonialism, you know, working class histories and impacted history writing, not just in India, but in Middle East and um, Latin America and elsewhere. So I want to return to that, uh, sort of taking on from there, not return to it, drawing on that. I feel that we inhabit a similar historical moment 
where we are being asked to justify our relevance. Where the historian, the liberalism is uh, on a, you know, the, the relationship between historical writing and liberal ideas is being questioned. You know, historians, our relationship with our present is being uh, questioned. There's a growing anti-intellectualism in the public sphere. So, and we are also having to engage with the limits of our professions, which uh, with attendant anxieties. So keeping these questions, like engaging with these questions, uh, and these questions, something I've been asking myself for a while now, what do we do with our craft? How does it impact our craft? And I think the answer lies in more public history. Now, I'll just take a moment to talk about public history. Now, public history, I'm understanding in different ways. One public history is where the historian writes for the public, writes for the audience that is public and not just their peers and for people within academia, because that changes the form in which we practice our craft. Just so far, our, our discipline has been catering to all of us write for each other. And because sometimes the writing is so complex that you can't, you can't make it digestible to the public. Yeah, And that has actually led to a lot of research lag, like the, our research reaching the public, getting into the textbooks, or getting into public sphere. So more historians writing for the public, where the public is the audience. Second is shifting our gaze from, and this is, I know this is not possible always for medieval and ancient history, but more so for the modern period, which I practice, shifting our gaze away from the colonial archive. Because ultimately, all said and done, as you know, Professor Habib and Najaf have highlighted, historian is tied to the archive. The archive is what separates me from a literary practitioner. We are all writing narratives, we all construct narratives, but there is a very vital difference between what historians do and what literatures do. And that is, I am tied to my archive. I cannot, I cannot move, I am tethered to the traces of the past. So for the historian today, modern historian at least, I think there has to be a shift towards, a little bit shift towards away from the colonial archive and, and institutionalized statist archives to community archives. And community archives are archives created and owned by communities. Because the belief is that the traditional colonial statist archives are also spaces of erasure. There are several things that don't get talked about or certain ways, like for the revolutionaries, the only way they appear in the archive are as anarchists and criminals. They never appears, they rarely ever appear as revolutionaries. So if I have to look for revolutionaries, I have to go elsewhere. Right. So, so that, that is what I mean by moving to community archives, looking at community histories, and uh, and therefore ma making uh, making uh, history writing more meaningful to the people you write about. And the third uh, element of public history, and this is one of the projects we are running. Uh, uh, this, this is a British Academy project, which is basically co-creation of knowledge between academia and the public, and engaging with the possibility of that. Because as uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Sampath has been trying to impress upon us. And he's correct in that, that there is a sort of a, uh, there is the, as if the wagon has been taken away, run away, the academics have gotten left behind, the wagon has been taken away by the popular. And the popular is no longer reading the stuff. I mean, they never read the stuff we wrote, but more so now they're reading WhatsApp. Yeah, they're reading uh, social media. So that is what has happened to us. That has, and, and that is filtered with propaganda that is, you know, filled with so much other stuff. And anybody can become a historian. Now we had a long tradition of amateur historians who were honest to the material that they encountered and they witnessed now that is that may not be always the case. So co-creation of this knowledge between academia and communities is very important to get the public to participate in the narratives and then for us to um, uh, engage with each other's narratives and produce epistemes in that manner is also very important. So that's really the way forward. We need to acknowledge the times we live in. So even academics can't get away from it. Yeah. I'll stop Thanks, here. Dr. Vedic. And uh, Vikram, can I ask you to go next? Yeah, I think in conclusion, I'd like to say, Yajur, that you know, when I, as a as a practicing historian and someone who's uh, involved with the discipline, I when I think of history writing, I'm reminded of that poem that we read as kids, you know, the blind men and the elephant, uh, where different blind men touch different parts of the elephant. And one said the elephant looks like the trunk. Someone said the elephant looks like the tail. Someone thought it was the the body of the elephant. Uh, they were all right, uh, all correct, but they were all partially wrong also uh, because the they were touching parts of the elephant that were uh, available to them 
and that they postulated that this is how the elephant looks. So history writing to me is very similar to that. We are all, you know, uh, glorified blind men searching for those uh, needles in a haystack. And based on whatever is available to us, the documents that speak to us, the archive that speak to us, the languages that we are, we rely largely on English, which limits our uh, entire Indian history to just 250, 300 years. So the wealth of information in several Indian languages, uh, classical languages, all of that uh, will give a more holistic idea of how this elephant looks. So that humility that needs to be there within uh, all of us as practitioners, that uh, this is not absolutist. This is not the truth. Uh, naiti, naiti, as they uh, always uh, said in Sanskrit, that the, na iti, na iti, this is not the end. There is always scope for revision. And if someone else finds some other part of the elephant in the picture that emerges is going to be very different. And that is one reason why, you know, you can write, you could, could have written, you could have been the most celebrated historian, court historian or otherwise, uh, if there is something else that comes up at a later stage, uh, which uh, kind of your, your, your most well-researched, well-written, well, uh, you know, publicized uh, work can also be thrown into the rubbish can uh, if some new discovery, some new uh, fact comes about. So that humility uh, of uh, us being co-travelers in this journey to rediscover our past and not have this intellectual arrogance of uh, this is what it is and there is nothing else to it and uh, to allow the mushrooming of multiple views, to allow the flowering of a million flowers uh, and let all of them make this composite uh, story come alive. I think that is very important uh, and not to look at every uh, attempt in a, de uh, in a derisive manner and to let, I mean, there are good, bad, politically motivated, uh, like I uh, you know, spoke about that circular. So there are circulars written then, there are circulars written now. Uh, all of this will keep happening till the cows come home to, uh, uh, you know, uh, for forever. So we'll let that be, but as professional historians, as historiographers, uh, I think to have that sense that we are all in it together to, to rediscover our past, I think that's very important while, while talking about a country as complicated as ours, with a history as, as vast, as fractured, as difficult, with so many interactions, with so many contemporary issues also that come into the politics of it all. I think that is very important for all of us and to pass on that to the future generations as well. Thank you, Ikram. Um, and finally, can I invite you, Dr. Habib, for concluding the debate? Well, thank you. It has been a, an instructive discussion. Um, but um, I would say that we have been somewhat harsh on historians who have written on the national movement. But Gandhi was a tar in place. I myself wrote, uh, wrote two small books on the national movement and had found much to criticize in Hind Swaraj. But the greatness of the man, if somebody doesn't recognize it, then I think there is something wrong with him. You can't compare him with other individuals in the national. They may be mentioned. In my book, you will find that even Savarkar is mentioned. But uh, um, the greatness of the man in his final hours, much is spoken about history, but who speaks about the great slaughter of 1947-48? In a, throughout the world, after World War II, it was the greatest slaughter and migration still despite what has happened in Indonesia and others. Nobody in this discussion spoke about that, which is totally ignored in our volumes. And the one man who stood against it was Gandhi. So how can one even compare anyone with that man? I think there is something wrong with a person who says that he has been overplayed. Nothing, no praise is enough for God. So one must recognize not only the facts, but also generalities. What was the impact of the man? What did he do? 
how many people he protected who would have otherwise been slaughtered, both in India and Pakistan. So clearly, behind this business of rewriting history, which the RSS has now been raising, and look at RSS's own record in 1947-48. They, they have been, I would rather say that in most books on the national movement, they have been, uh, their rule has not been properly assessed and condemned. How many of them celebrated Gandhi's death? I was a young man of 16 at that time, I knew. So there are many corners of history which for politeness we are not mentioned. That's just politeness. But if this kind of thing is opened, let those things also be opened. What you did, what did you do against the English? How did you celebrate Gandhi's death? What were you talking, saying about Gandhi? What about Savarkar's role in Gandhi's death? All those things also are parts of history. So when you talk about rewriting history, let it be spread over all the, the, the entire range, not just the ranges you pick, not your Nazi-like love of Aryans, I mean, I don't see any difference between what Hitler said in 1933 about rewriting German history to prove that Germans were the original Aryans and the UGC circular saying that there was no Aryan invasion, but the Aryans went out from India. India is the home of the Aryans. What is the difference between the two? So this rewriting stuff is just to present a false history of the Indian people. There is no reference of the, to the caste system in ancient India. No, no, no reference to how Dalits were treated, how Shudras were treated. But the caste system begins in medieval India, according to their syllabus. So this kind of rewriting is totally, um, is not a, at all due to academic concerns. It is not at all due to nationalist concerns. It is simply because to create a false and fictitious history for the Indian people, which any respect, uh, self-respecting historian will never admit to. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Professor Abhi. Vikram, you wanted to make a quick point? I'd just like to add, I think I kind of agree with what Professor Habib said. There has to be a holistic view of, uh, um, you know, people, their contributions, their roles. So like he says, one has to assess the, uh, the role of certain individuals, organizations. We should also then also assess the role of the, that organization like the CPI played in 1942, uh, you know, in the Quit India movement, where uh, there are documentary evidences of how they were acting as spies for the British, uh, Sir uh, Richard Tottenham, the additional secretary in the Home Department, or Sir Reginald Maxwell, the Home Member, to whom regularly details of the underground movement, the uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, or the INA, all these reports were being given by PC, uh, CP Joshi, who was the Politburo member of the CPI. So yeah, all these things also need to come out. Similarly, uh, for, after the heinous a crime of the murder of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, what has not been told to most people in India that there was also a, a carnage against the Maharashtrian Brahmins, very similar to what happened in 1984 uh, against the Sikhs, only because the assassins belong to a particular community. Uh, these, have, uh, these have just been airbrushed saying such a thing never happened. And that's why I come back to my other point that please uh, you know, let history offer that space where we recount these, uh, not selectively whitewash and airbrush, depending on uh, your convenience, your political inclination. Let everything be mentioned there. there. There needs to be that truth and reconciliation. And every the role assessment of everybody, every individual, the omissions and commissions of all of them put uh, on paper, every community's angst uh, uh, also, uh, you know, put there. And with that healing, we move forward. Uh, so, you know, we've, done, we've made peace with our past. I think in India, we've not made peace with our past. And that is why the past has this ominous uh, manner of resurfacing itself in very, very dangerous uh, way. 
uh, in different spheres, whether it's in politics or society. So strangely, I do agree, but I would like to expand that and not limit it once again, limiting it to one particular group or so, so on. So let's have a frank discussion about everyone and everything under the sun. Uh, if you're talking about the murder, let's also talk about the aftermath of the murder. You can't talk about one and then omit the other and then say that is complete history. So the elephant, if you have to understand, the blind men need to all come together and uh, put together the explanation of all the parts of that elephant. Only then you will get a complete picture. Thanks. Thanks, Okay, Dr. Heather wants to get the. Uh, please keep it brief. You want to. Yeah, yeah. This is just a counterpoint to uh, Sampath's uh, metaphorical elephant and the blind man. I would liken the historian to another blind man. And this comes from a medieval Persian text. A blind man was walking with a lamp, and people who passed by asked him, Why are you carrying a lamp? you are blind. And his answer was, it's not for me. It's for you that you do not knock me down. <clears throat> um, thank you. I think there is, uh, thank you, Dr. Heather. Thank you, Dr. Vedic. Thank you, Professor Habib. And thank you, Vikram, Dr. Sampat. Uh, I think the point about whether India has not yet made peace with its past or whether the established peace is now being disturbed for various political agenda is a topic for another debate. It's going, there, is a, there is a lot of strong views and convictions there. So we'll keep that for another day. But for now, thanks to all of you for coming to Argumentative Indians. It was an honor to host all of you. And uh, I learned a lot listening to your perspective. Thank you, thanks a lot. I hope to have you again with us in the future. Namaskar. Thank you, Yajur. Thank you. Thank you.